button. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Very welcome to the UK Undergraduate Admission Insights webinar being hosted by the Dreamcatchers today. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Surbhi Kumar, and I am the founder of the Dreamcatchers and also your host for this webinar today. Let me start with telling you a little bit about our firm, the Dreamcatchers. We are an education consulting firm with a mission to assist students in realizing their dream of obtaining quality and best fit education. So how do we do that? For grade 9th and grade 10 students, the immediate need is that they select the right subject combinations, right stream. And for grade 11th and grade 12th students, it's primarily uh, the course selection and the college list creation. So what we do is we start with something which is called as a psychometric assessment test, which tests a student's aptitude, their personality trait, and their work interest area. On the basis of these three dimensions, a detailed career fitment report gets generated, which has the information around top 10 career clusters, which are best aligned to this student. Okay, now we utilize this report and get into an individualized and personalized counseling with the student and with the family and give them different career options, which again is out of that set or could be out of that said too, but uh, it, it will give you information around different career pathways and detailed action plan wherever needed. We also provide our services in the higher education admission guidance space, both for overseas and Indian universities and both for undergraduate and postgraduate admissions. What we do is we start with the profile assessment and profile building as well as profile elevation. We also help the student in the course shortlisting and also the country shortlisting. We help the student with mapping the best fit college to their profile and to their needs. We also provide statement of purpose guidance, essay writing guidance, and also letter of recommendation guidance to their recommenders per se. Uh, scholarship guidance, helping them in interview preparation wherever there is a need, and also visa guidance. So, uh, this was about the dream catchers. And now I would want to give you a lineup of our session today. So basically what you can expect for uh, Oh, for over an hour or so of today's session. So, of course, we'll talk about UK undergraduate uh, admission insights, primarily touching upon the application process overview, giving you a glance of top universities, what are different academic intakes, what are the different steps and components, and what is an ideal timeline. So keep in mind that this is just a process overview. We will not dive deeper into the details per se. But of course, the highlight of our session today is fireside chat with Rohil Kapoor, who represents University of Nottingham, which is a Russell Group University. And he will provide his recommendations and advice to all the students out here. And I also see uh, one or two parents as well for the UK undergraduate admissions, and he will particularly shed more light on the University of Nottingham admissions as well. So we will keep aside some time for Q&A uh, as well. So keep posting your questions in the Q&A box or chat box. Depending upon the time we have in hand, we will pick few questions or I'll try to cover your questions uh, with mine. And you can also go live as well. Just uh, raise your hand or use the raise hand reaction and I will uh, open the floor for you to ask the question directly to Rohil. Okay, with that, given it's a Sunday morning, I would want to start off uh, with a warm up quiz. So on your screen, you see two questions. I'll not read out the questions, just read it yourself and just take like uh, five to 10 seconds to put your responses uh, in the chat or Q&A box, whichever you see on the screen right now. Okay. I can definitely see a few responses coming in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, all of you who responded, you are absolutely right. So for first question, the answer is United Kingdom. And yes, UK does issue post-study work permit for international students. With that, let's look at the universities uh, in UK just at a glance. So UK has over three universities and colleges. Russell Group's 24 members universities are 
the world class universities in terms of teaching and also these are research intensive universities you can see i have listed out all the 24 russell group universities and university of nottingham is one of those now course duration for these uh, undergraduate programs at these universities is primarily 3 years but some of the scotland uh, based universities they offer 4 year undergraduate degrees uh, in terms of application process, you can utilize uh, something which is called as universities and college admission services, popularly known as UCAS, which is the centralized admission service for higher education. Okay, And uh, with uh, the session itself, you will get few more insights around it. Now, when we talk about the academic intakes, UK has primarily three intakes. So let's talk about the September or October intake because that's the one which is primarily preferred by international students generally and particularly Indian students because it aligns very well with their high school completion. And it is also the largest intake in terms of uh, number of students and it offers widest range of courses as such. In terms of application deadline, it falls between like say April to June uh, of the same year itself. Now, if we talk about other intakes like January and May, keep in mind that only limited courses are available during these intakes. And when we talk about January intake, it's like October to December is the application deadline, October to December of the previous year before the uh, uh, the uh, academic year starts and May intake, it's primarily February uh, to April of that year itself. Okay, moving on, I just wanted to help the students and uh, the parents out here to just get an overview around what are the key steps. So, of course, you start with researching the courses, researching the universities, and you can utilize something which is called or offered by UCAS itself, which is called UCAS Hub. You should definitely check the entry requirements of the course you are interested in at that particular university. Now, once you have researched the course, researched the university, start preparing your application, and we will talk about the components of the application as well. But definitely, you should have your academic transcripts or what we call as mark sheets in place. Sometimes universities might need even your 10th, 11th mark sheets. It varies from university to university, but definitely 12th predictive grades as such. Uh, enroll for any kind of course specific admission test or written work requirements as such. English proficiency test, that's uh, something which we strongly advise that you should take because it's something uh, which even if the university may not be asking for it, depending upon the curriculum you are taking, uh, it's also needed for visa requirement as such. Then definitely one other component is statement of purpose. So once you have prepared your application, go ahead and apply. You can apply directly uh, on uh, via UCAS. You can take help of uh, any education consultant or even your school counselor. And there are also authorized agents as well who help in applying uh, through UCAS. Now, once you have uh, filled in your application, submitted your application, for some of the universities, it may happen that uh, they will ask you to appear for your application is shortlisted. And the, on the basis of your entire application plus interview, there would be a conditional offer which would be rolled out. Now you can go ahead and uh, evaluate the offers which you have from multiple universities, give your acceptance and uh, also pay the deposit money as such. Now comes the another important component, which is this visa. Now uh, you should have your proof of finance in place and your conditional offer should have converted into an unconditional offer. And Rohil will also touch upon these things later in the presentation as well, or something which is called as confirmation of acceptance or studies. You should have paid your healthcare surcharge. So once you have done that, uh, start hunting for accommodation pretty early. Many a times universities would offer their residential campus accommodation itself, preferably for first year students, it's generally done, but also it's on first come first serve uh, basis and other factors as well. So it's better you start the accommodation hunt sooner than later. Now prepare for your departure. One important thing which I would want to highlight here is do attend the pre-departure briefings or orientation which your university to uh, which like you have got admission is uh, organizing in your home country because that will prepare you well for the journey ahead. Okay. 
with that uh, let's uh, touch upon the application components of course the application form or application details to be filled in the ucas then school transcripts which i mentioned earlier as well having test codes uh, uh, in place uh, for some of the uh, admission tests like university of oxford if that's what you are thinking of you may have to give thinking skill assessment test and depending upon the course you are taking at a particular university you may also have to appear for other admission test english proficiency test then having your personal statement in place which showcase your personality your goals and why you are applying to that particular course and program as such recommendation letter which includes a recommendation letter from your teacher from your school counselor so giving them uh, a heads up that you you are applying to uk universities you would need their support is very very important in certain programs you may also need uh, a portfolio especially like if you are applying to creative programs like fine arts performing arts or architecture programs you may also have supplementary materials uh, especially like uh, additional written work which is asked by few of the universities and for scholarships and awards you may or may not have to write additional uh, essays or uh, purpose letter as such uh interview or panel interviews is something as i mentioned some of the universities may ask for as well now also uh, focus on creating uh, your profile in terms of building co curricular and super curricular activities which uh, projects or showcases your passion and involvement in the subject which you wish to study in the college okay now in terms of timeline when we talk about 2025 intake these are few important timelines which you should keep in mind uh, 15th october uh, is something if you are thinking of either cambridge or oxford because you can apply to uh, only one of those in one admission cycle or if you are thinking of medicine veterinary medicine and dentistry courses then the deadline is 15th october itself which is again like few weeks from now uh, the other one is 29th january and this is uh, the one which many of the indian students if they are not thinking of uh, the other courses and the colleges which i mentioned for 15th october deadline they apply to then the last one is 30th june but i would suggest let's not think that uh, as a deadline itself let's think of just 29 january because beyond that it becomes uh, too tight as well for students uh, again uh, just to give you some idea of how you can plan your application and i'm just taking one scenario to explain things well so supposedly if you are applying for september october 2025 intake and with the deadline as 29 january 2025 and if you are a grade 10th or grade 11 student and even in your early grade 12th as such i would urge you to utilize this time to research and research very well in terms of your intended courses or college list and if you want you can take help of uh, education consultants like us or any anyone else to do this research really well utilize your time also to build the right co curricular and super curricular activities that's very very important now uh, entering august in your grade 12 i would say just uh, it's better if you would have given your english proficiency test by then uh, if you give it later as well that's fine but this is what we recommend so that things are very well structured for you and you're not struggling last minute now september and october is the timeline when you should uh, have your finalized college list uh, you should register prepare and attempt the admission test wherever needed do your pre work in terms of personal statement you may have to create uh, multiple drafts before you create your final version and also wherever the written work is required by november december make sure that you have the recommendation letter from your school counselor and the teacher and uh, i know december early january is also the time frame when the grade 12 students are occupied with their other internal exams or pre boards as such so once you are done with that maybe you can submit your uh, application uh, before the january 29th deadline february march i would say evaluate and accept the offers which you have got and do your acceptance may june is something where you will have to focus on the visa process and august september early october you are ready to uh, fly and uh, just experience uh, a transformative journey now also one important recommendation which we want to give to all the students out here that it's very important to create a balanced college list right so that you have your 
options in place you have few safety schools you have few dream schools and few target as well okay so uh, with that i would also just want to give you some insight of oxford and cambridge timeline and this is uh, what is uh, published on oxford uh, website itself because the timelines is little different uh, from other colleges so as you can see 15th october is their deadline in terms of ucas applications as such and you can visit uh, oxford website and see this there too but this uh, timeline and the earlier ideal timeline which i shared will help you prepare your application in a much more structured way okay and uh, reduce any kind of last minute stress with that uh, i am pleased to invite uh, rohil and i'll just uh, update the settings so that rohil can turn on his camera and audio Hey, good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you, Rohil? Very good, thank you. Thank I think you so a lot much. Of good, good details covered in the last ten minutes. I was just listening to everything. Thank you so much, and I am pretty sure with like forty-five, fifty minutes we have in hand, you would also be providing more details, which is certainly going to be very, very helpful to our students and parents who have joined us uh, for today's session. Yes. Okay, so though University of Nottingham doesn't need too much of uh, an introduction, but I just wanted to uh, highlight few of the things related to the university. As you can see, in terms of ranking, it's top 20 university in the UK, though we should not be only focusing on rankings, but they have their own merit as well, so should be considered to an extent. Uh, university of, of Nottingham uh, students' life is very, very active. They have a lot of clubs and it's uh, top under top five UK university for student life particularly. It was awarded Sports University of the Year. If we talk about Nottingham as a city, it's again one of the best student cities in the UK and it's pretty close to London, just uh, one and a half hours uh, ride via train itself. So I hope that gives you some perspective about the university. So without further delay, I'll just dive into our questions uh, for uh, Rohil. And I want to remind the audience as well that you can put in your questions in the chat box and I would be the one who would be receiving it and I will ask uh, as well. Okay. So here goes my first question for you, Rohil. Uh, what suggestions and tips do you have for students who are trying to narrow down their list of potential universities for the undergraduate program in the UK? So I think uh, there are certain factors that students can focus on. Of course, the first thing is that since UK is only three years as compared to a US, which is a four year program, they have to be a little sure in terms of what they want to do. So you have to have an idea if I'm going in for engineering or computer science, I need that clarity because UK uh, will not have that option where you're going in for a foundation year and then selecting. So we we actually require the students to have some sort of an idea that, okay, computer science with AI or English is what I want to study. So course becomes the number one factor. Um, they need to look at where the rankings are in terms of the course. Um, overall rankings, of course, very important. If you think your score will be over um, a 90%, in your class 12th exams or if you're an IB student around 34 to 36 then look at the Russell Group universities um, so these are 24 um, member universities where you can look at if you think it's going to be below or 90 percent then you look at the other options um, second I think the location becomes very important because you're going to be spending three years in that particular city and in that particular country so it becomes very important that what are you learning apart from just your basic coursework um how is the student life so when i was a student in the uk i think uh it's one part of it is of course the education part of it and how it is taught but apart from that a lot of it you learn by, by joining clubs and societies by even part-time work i think mm -hmm. uh, most of us think part-time work is for um, like of course you get to earn pocket money which i also did but then um, you learn a lot because there are people from different nationalities coming over and working. So we used to go in different locations to 
let's say maybe a race course today and you're working with people from uh, Mexico, from China. So there also you pick up a lot of things and which is one of the reasons why you're actually going, uh, being an international student. Um, number three, I would focus on uh, facilities. So like University of Nottingham is very good for sports. So if that is an important criteria for somebody, um, how are the sports facilities? Are they free? So everyone who stays on our campus gets a free membership to the sports facility. So that becomes a big factor. Then you have clubs and societies. Check the website. Uh, how many do they have? Uh, are they actually active or not? Because a lot of universities will have 200, 300 clubs and societies, but how many of them meet up every week or actively organize something? If you're interested in consulting as a job, then how many um, consulting societies are there? Uh, who have they partnered with? Who have they invited? So all of these also become uh, an important factor. Great. I think all excellent uh, point, uh, Rohil. So I have received one question already, but uh, Mahil, I will take that up shortly as well because it's covered in one of my questions too. So just uh, be patient there. Uh, Rohil, tell us more about uh, Russell Group Universities. What is unique about those universities? What distinct advantage does the University of Nottingham particularly provide that really set it apart from any other Russell Group University as well? Yeah, so Russell Group is basically, um, it's it's a member group of 24 universities. If you look at the group, it's called Oxford, Cambridge, Warwick, uh, Nottingham, Birmingham. So these are all good universities. Um, they've all been there for a while. So if you look at individually, most of them will be at least 100, 150 years old. So mm -hmm. a lot of legacy involved. But uh, what you associate with the Russell Group is the research factor. So if you go on the website, you'll see that two thirds of the research actually comes down from um, Russell Group of universities. So they contribute a lot to the research that is going on in the UK. Um, individually, if if I come down to the university, we have a tie up, let's say, with a Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce has an office inside uh, University of Nottingham. Uh, similarly, you you will find that Warwick has a tie up with uh, Jaguar. So these are all very good industry tie ups and you'll find these to be more common with Russell Group uh, as compared to the non-Russell Group. So it's not that non-Russell Group universities are not nice. Uh, all of them are good. It, this is just a group which is which focuses on research. And uh, if you are getting into research, of course, that then relates to employability. So most of uh, Russell Group universities will rank very highly when, when it comes to like skilled or getting uh, very good employability. So research and employability is where I would say Russell Group is uh, very, very good. OK, great. Thank you so much, uh, Rohil. And my next question is particularly around the application process. Though through the details I provided earlier in the presentation, I tried to cover uh, a few things. But definitely hearing straight from the horse's mouth, it's what our uh, students and parents here would appreciate. So just walk us through the application process, particularly for international students uh, applying from India. And does it really vary university by university or does it uh, stays almost the same? Right. Um, it will be, I think, 70 to 80 percent, it will be the same. There'll be a slight uh, difference in terms of entry requirements, how they process and what important factors are there for them individually. Um, so I'll go through the process from the beginning. So you have already uh, mentioned the guidelines. So if a student is going in for veterinary medicine, uh, medicine or uh, dentistry, then they need to apply by 15th of October. Um, if not, most of the students end up applying by the January deadline. So everyone should keep uh, in mind that they should complete the full process by January. Uh, what are the factors that we're looking at? So we are looking at predicted grades because our process of issuing a conditional offer is based on the predicted grades. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding from your uh, counselor and teacher how the predicted grades are issued is very, very important. Is that based on class 11th? Is that based on the half yearlies of 12th? So that understanding you should get uh, right before you start your application. Because in the end, um, you cannot even have an 88 instead of a 90 because we will not issue an offer. So mm -hmm. it has to be exactly a 90 if we are uh, looking at that. Uh, then we look at 
uh, a letter of recommendation uh, that will come from your uh, counselor and teacher and a personal statement. So right now, personal statement is a common one for all uh, five UK universities that you're applying for. So it's at a very broad level. You cannot mention the name of the university. Uh, you cannot mention the name of the professor. So it has to be around the subject area. If you're applying for law, then it has to be around everything around law. What we are trying to understand is the factors that motivated you uh, to take up law um, and, and give two examples and focus on those examples. So we don't need too many examples. We don't need a big story. Just two straight examples on what made you select law and what sort of a career you're looking at because we uh, in the UK focus uh, at academics more. So uh, we want to understand that what are the steps that the student has already taken and how serious the student is and basically how passionate you are. So you divide the personal statement into 80 and 20. 80 is mainly academics. 20 is your personal section where you can write that you have participated in a competition or you play the guitar, you play the sports. So basically th that 20% is about you and 80% is all about the subject area. So personal statement, predicted grades um, and letter of recommendation. We need these three things. Um, students will submit on UCAS. And then usually around four weeks is when we get back with a conditional offer. Once that is done, then we wait for the students to give their exams. Once they have their results, if they score what is required according to the conditional offer, then we issue an automatically uh, unconditional offer. And later on, uh, we issue a CAS document, which is confirmation of acceptance of studies. And then the student applies for the visa. That's the full uh, process. So for an undergrad student, we don't look for um, any deposits. All we want is that the student should mark the University of Nottingham as a firm choice. choice yeah. Because students will get two options. One is your firm choice. One is your insurance. That's your backup option. Uh, the way to apply to UK is that you have at least two backup options, two realistic options, and one dream university. So if you don't get into that dream university, you have good two real options where mostly, let's say, if you score around a 90%, you aim for those universities which need a 90 and then keep a backup option which needs an 85 just in case uh, a situation like that comes in because then you will have a backup uh, option with you so all of this is done uh, during may and june later on what happens is that we enter into a process called clearing so this only happens after 30th of june if we still have uh, any seats available then we drop the entry requirements by a grade. So from 90%, we'll come down to an 87%. Or a 93%, let's say for economics, we need 93%. So we come down to uh, 90%. So we'll usually drop it, but there's a risk involved that if the seats are full, we might not actually enter into uh, clearing. In the last two years, we have been entering into clearing for certain courses. Uh, but again, that, that should not be your main goal. And by chance, if the score is not that much, then clearing becomes a way to uh, enter the universities. And then it's mainly a direct application to the university. You fill up a form with your personal statement and your mark sheets. Within two days, then the university is going to get back to you with uh, an unconditional offer. So waiting till May and June is like quite a risky thing, as I understand even from your response as well. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Rohil. I think you touched upon uh, the components required in a greater detail as well. Uh, but help us understand what role does a personal statement has to play, specifically if you have to wear the hat of the admission tutor uh, in UK who is evaluating a student's application, and uh, what are your advice and even the tips which you can offer to the students out here for drafting their personal statement? So uh, this is where it will depend a lot on the universities. So some of them, let's say the top five ranked universities will play a lot of will pay a lot of attention to the personal statement because that is how the student will be uh, differentiated from another one. If all of the students have a 93, 95%, uh, what is the differentiating factor? That's where uh, the personal statement really helps. Mm -hmm. So it has to be very simple. Um, if you are going in for medicine, 
what motivated you to go in for medicine mm -hmm. uh, so since the very beginning um did you see a doctor um did someone come to the school did you watch a show maybe all of these things the motivating factors uh, that's what we are looking at we pay a certain amount of attention to the personal statement but it's not the most important thing for us yeah so it is of course very important and it can lead to rejection if you write a very poor sop but usually our focus stays on academics so we will consider your um, class 12th predicted grades and then finally what you score and we of course will go through your personal statement but courses like medicine they have clearly written that we don't uh, look at the personal statement we are only concerned with your class 10th and the ucat entrance exam mm -hmm. so certain universities but but certain universities like i think i was talking to kings uh, a couple of weeks ago and for them personal statement is very very important so that will slightly differ. I think when you look at the rankings and that uh, person statement will differ according to the university requirements. Great. I think it's very, very important for students to uh, just not rush into creating their personal statement. Uh, your first version might not be the most refined one. So right. it's it's advisable to start early. I know students procrastinate a lot on this component itself but it's important that you give a couple of months in terms of writing a good personal statement for yourself that's what i would just want to add on to what uh, rohil just mentioned yeah plus i think ucas has very good resources so they have like three minutes videos um it's all going to show on how you can design your personal statement uh what are the factors that you should include what not but like you said it should not be over complicated we just want to understand why this course, if you if you can explain it in that uh, 4000 characters, that's all that we are uh, looking for. Great. Thank you so much, Rohil. Uh, now I'll move on to uh, admission test, particularly. Mm -hmm. I know that some of the universities do ask for admission test. Uh, what is University of Nottingham policy there? And uh, if you consider admission tests particularly, which are very, very uh, UK focused as such, or rather being uh, kind of hosted uh, by the UK universities particularly, what about some of the other tests as well, which are very popular uh, in India, as well as uh, even for other countries admissions like SAT, uh, ACT and even I know students give advanced placements as well, which is primarily again for you, US. But what's your entire take on admission tests particularly? Right. So um, for medicine, we need an exam called UCAT and they need to submit the score by 15th of October. So that is the deadline. Uh, UCAS is the most, UCAT is the most important factor when we look at a medicine application because we club the scores with the class 10 scores and then we create a points based system. So uh, we used to require LNAT for our entrance exam, uh, sorry for law, but now we don't need uh, LNAT. Mm -hmm. And since mm -hmm. then we've noticed that the applications have almost doubled. Um, but our only exam that we need, I think is UCAT for now. SATs, we don't really consider it's more for the US um so indian students because there are equivalencies for all of the different curriculums like you have isc um cbsc or a levels and ib so then we don't really consider sats and since we've not written that on the website so if a student is submitting these scores and another one is not then it's not fair to the student who is not uh, submitting so it will not create a major impact on your uh, application. But still, if you think you are giving it for other universities, you can include that in your application. Great. Got it. Uh, again, I have received a few more questions. Maybe I'll take Karthik's question for now. He is asking, do credits change between an Indian student and, and an abroad student? Uh, no. So I think credits are very... Um, like it's an internal process of the university to issue the degree so it doesn't really make a difference whether you're studying here because each module um, let's say uk each module will be 20 credits or give you 10 credits and uh, for example a master students needs 180 credits to get the degree with 60 being for dissertation 
Mm. Uh, but this is all an internal process for the university to evaluate and issue the degree, and it won't really have a big difference. Yeah, agree. Uh, while we were talking of admission tests itself, there are like other tests as well, like the English proficiency test, right? So what is your view on that? Should uh, students, uh, Indian students be giving that or are there any exceptions as well? So we offer a waiver. We have uh, anybody who has scored uh, over 75 in English in 10th mm -hmm. or 12th from CBSC, ISC boards uh, will get an automatic waiver. So we don't look for uh, IELTS exam. And I, I'm assuming that if someone is applying to University of Nottingham, they do have uh, a score of over 75 in English. Mm -hmm. So we don't really need IELTS or a Pearson test of English in that case. If your score is below 75, then yes, we do need. Or if you're coming in from a state board, then we do need. Uh, but otherwise, we don't really look for it. And this will slightly vary for different universities, but we've had this policy. Uh, for central boards, because the medium of English, uh, medium is in English, then we yeah. don't really need um, an IELTS exam. Okay. And Rohil, I do have uh, one Cambridge and one IB student as well from my like existing student cohort itself who has joined right. this session. Right. Can you mention about uh, their curriculum as well, particularly for English proficiency? Sure. So if, if it's A-levels and if we have a score of B in English, then it's an automatic waiver. If okay. it's IB and I think if they score a four or a five in English, that becomes um, a waiver again. Okay. So it's relatively easier for A levels and IB students to get that waiver. And uh, for CBSE and IC, it's being kept at 75. Okay. Uh, but what would be your view in terms of like visa per se? So that was the university perspective or university requirement. How about for visa purpose? Yeah, so I, I want to clarify this because a lot of students think that getting a job will be a problem if you don't give the English language uh, like exam. Uh, basically, the process involved is that the university is going to issue a CAS document, uh, which is confirmation of acceptance of studies, which is a sponsorship letter that the university is satisfied with your uh, English language requirements. So okay. the university is taking ownership that the student, uh, we are satisfied with the language requirements and this will not be a problem so yeah. when you enter uh, uk at the immigration or when you apply for the visa the cas is the most important document yeah so if you have the cas if the if the university is taking responsibility that okay rohil is rohil meets the english language requirements uh then there will be no issues at all uh, entering uk or even applying for jobs so i think there's a big misconception involved uh, okay. But but I don't think it is needed, uh, especially from A level IB students and CBSC IC students who've studied uh, in English their entire lives. So I don't think uh, it, it creates a difference. Okay, so you're saying uh, that should not be a concern because that's where no. we have got mixed responses from the university reps of different UK universities itself that. Just to be safe, it's better to give your English proficiency test. But uh, this is a good perspective which you bring to the table today. Because it's an additional cost. You're anyway spending a lot of money on your application. Um, and visa rejection rate in the UK is very low. It's like 2%. Yeah. So I wouldn't recommend because why spend the additional 20,000 when you're already spending that kind of money? So uh, for me, if you have good scores in English, you get the CAS document. Avoid the uh, English proficiency test. Good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now let's touch upon, and you have kind of hinted towards it in your earlier response as well, but just help the uh, students and families out here understand what's the difference between UK undergrad education and other uh, major destinations which are considered by Indians primarily, be it, be it Canada, US, or Australia. What's the difference? Okay. Um, yes, so I think one big difference is that even when you compare with India, so let's say for law, uh, law in the UK is just three years. Um, if you do that in the, if you do that in India or any other country, then it becomes a five-year course. So you end up saving two years when you go in for law. Um, most of the degrees are specialized degrees. So if I talk about management, if I talk about um, medicine, law, economics. 
Uh, so we don't really have that option of the student going in for a foundation year and then selecting what they want to study. Um, U.S. gives that flexibility because U.S. is uh, U.S. has four year uh, degrees. So they will what they will do is they will have a foundation year, give you a lot of options, and then you choose what you want to study in year two. So probably if someone's not sure of what they want to do, then U.S. becomes a better option. Mm -hmm. If you are sure of what you plan to study and you have certain like some idea that computer science is my thing or English is my thing, then uh, UK becomes a better option because you save on the living costs for that one year. You save on the tuition fees and then you can opt in for things like a placement year where within the same span, let's say a student studying in the US uh, will just study for four years. Here you have three years of your uh, education and one year of a placement year as well. So you you got that one year of internship experience as well mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, while you were studying. So I think uh, mainly those we do we do have certain courses like let's say liberal arts, uh, which is now becoming very popular, and that gives uh, flexibility between eighteen different subject areas. So students can mix and match between media and communications, politics, English. So certain courses will allow, um, but most of the courses will be very, very specific because we do get students who want to study marketing, but now we don't have a three year program in marketing. So they'll have to go in for management and maybe one or two of them being uh, uh, subjects uh, which involve marketing or digital marketing subjects like that. So uh, key aspects in, in like just to summarize would be that if you know what you want to do, then UK in more specialized time saving. Uh, U.S. if you're not very sure and more towards, let's say, arts-based uh, courses. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to one other important, uh, or rather I would say the most important element for the families to decide a destination as well, which is primarily the cost of attendance as such, right? So now definitely studying abroad is uh, a costly affair. Uh, so help us understand how does the undergraduate tuition fees, particularly at UK universities, it's compared to other uh, popular study abroad destinations again, like, sorry, US, Canada, Australia for that matter. And uh, what is the average tuition fees for any of the UK university? Right. So this would range. Um, it depends on the university. But the range would be, I think, somewhere around, let's say, 15,000 per year to about 30,000 per year. So this, of course, uh, depends on the ranking of the university. Of course, the higher ranked ones will uh, charge a little more. So you will see that, OK, our specifically lab based courses are very expensive. If okay. you're going in for biotechnology um, or research based courses like engineering, these will cost around 26 to 30,000 pounds um, at University of Nottingham. Business school, I think, is around 23 to 24,000 pounds per year. Okay. Uh, most of them will range around that 26,000 pounds. Like computer science will be around 26 to 28. Um, if someone's going in for a placement year, we usually charge a small proportion. Okay. Um, the thing with Nottingham is that we have uh, international campuses. So then students can spend that uh, semester or a year in China and Malaysia. And we've got 10 really good partners. Uh, okay. They are based in different uh, countries. So UBC is our partner in Canada and NUS Singapore is our partner. So if someone wants to do a mix of these two, uh, that is also possible. Okay. Okay. In fact, uh, one of our courses called International Management has this option where you have to study a year two and abroad. So okay. you spend one year in the UK and year two has to be either China, Malaysia campus or any of the partners. And uh, Australia is also in, like, in it. I think it's, it's Melbourne or Sydney where we have a partner. Yeah. So if someone wants that additional exposure, the tie ups with the universities in other countries are also very, very good. That's true. Okay. So uh, any advice on the strategies which uh, a student or a family can take in terms of reducing their overall cost of uh, attendance and even if uh, possible, just touch upon the scholarships and other kind of financial aids as well. So scholarships are, of course, very important aspect. Um, we usually give scholarships that cover six to eight thousand pounds. 
okay. and that's only for year one. So okay. we mainly offer uh, post-grad scholarships. We've got a few hundred percent scholarships as well. Okay. Uh, but when you look at undergrad, um, UK does get a lot of students locally from UK. So it mm -hmm. becomes very competitive. So that's why they don't really uh, issue a lot of uh, scholarships or give a lot of scholarships. Whereas post-grad, if you look at uh, most of the students are international students, and that's why the universities end up giving more scholarships. So two aspects, one could be a department-based scholarship. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have really good scores, let's say for our computer science, we have about 10 to 20 scholarship. If someone has, let's say, a 95%, we will automatically consider these students for the merit-based scholarship. Uh, second, we have application-based scholarships where first step, we need the students to hold an offer. Um, and second, answer about five to 10 questions on, uh, which is basically a detail or like more an extended SOP that why Nottingham, uh, career objectives, any achievements till now. So scholarships uh, is an important factor. Second, uh, then you filter out according to uh, the universities. If you go slightly lower in terms of the rankings, then they will have, uh, let's say, a lower fees. Yeah. But right now, uh, scholarships becomes the only factor in terms of reducing the overall cost. Part-time work does help, but uh, from my experience, part-time work will not cover a proportion of your tuition fees. It will just help you uh, with a little pocket money or cover your dinners and travel, uh, but it will not cover a major portion of your uh, tuition fees. Okay. Since you touched upon part-time work, so. Uh... Can you just tell what is the policy or regulation around that too? How many hours in a week? Yeah, so students can work for 20 hours a week in the UK. And during the break, I think there becomes a, a time where you can work for longer. So you have three months in your summer time and one month uh, during your winter time. So all of these times you can intern with the company and I think you can work for 40 hours. But most of the times it's limited to 20 hours. Um, each year we uh, hire student ambassadors. So I think that becomes a very good way to uh, earn that pocket money or become um, like a student ambassador where you're just mainly talking to students, showing them the campus. It's a nice uh, job also to do and you get that uh, pocket money. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, Trapti, I do see your question as well. We'll try to take it, but our focus today is more around the application process understanding. So we'll see if we are able to cover all the other pertinent questions related to application, then we may take that. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to the housing situation, uh, particularly in the UK. Uh, is student accommodation easily available uh, there? How is the process and how students can really make it easy for themselves when it comes to housing? Right. So if you're an undergrad student, it uh, makes a lot of sense to stay on campus. And I think I've covered this before because especially helps you with um, taking an active part in the clubs and societies. Um, you don't have to travel to, to attend your class. So it's a lot convenient. Um, third factor being that you can use the sports facilities, the tennis courts or uh, badminton courts, whichever facilities you um, like, then you can use that more often because you'll just be li living like 10 minutes away or it'll be a five minutes walk from the, these facilities. Um, I tend to think that you build better relationships when you're studying at a campus based university, because mm -hmm. if you're studying in a big city, then of course you will attend your class and everyone's going, going to go away to their um, respective houses. So you don't uh, really spend a lot of time together. Whereas in a campus based university, you're actually going to be, everyone's going to be studying in the same library. Yeah. Everyone will be eating at the same restaurant. So the time you spend or the relationships you build uh, in those three years are much better as compared to a city based university, just because campus based universities will have that space involved. So we have a 300 acre campus, a lot of accommodation options. Um, we guarantee it if a student applies by July. Okay. So if a student applies by 31st of July in, for that particular intake um, and gives us three choices, we'll definitely give one out of the three uh, choices. 
so Same. accommodation is not an issue um it's catered as well so you get all three meals breakfast lunch and dinner um usually for lunch they get a coupon and they can go to any of the restaurants but uh, breakfast and lunch is very close to the accommodation uh, facility where they can get food because when you're 17 18 and you don't really know how to cook so you can't eat out the whole time and it's important i think getting catered halls of food i think is a very important factor because uh, otherwise you tend to skip meals and you will of course not eat healthy meals so that way i think when you're considering universities uh, do look at catered halls do they have this or not and uh, we offer it for most of our accommodation so you can opt in for that but um, accommodation i think uh, for certain cities it has been a problem I, uh, but i think the government's really focusing on this in terms of building more accommodations so most of the students will stay on campus in year one and then once they know uh, everything about the campus they usually move out with their friends uh, to the city center so city center is about 10 minutes away uh, and you, if you want, you can still continue to stay on campus in year two as well. And you get the similar services like the food catered, all of those options. So totally up to you, but year one, I highly recommend staying on uh, campus. Got it. I think with that response, you have really addressed some of the, or I would say one of the most important concerns of parents specifically, right? So great. Thank you so much for that. Now I'll move on to uh, the next question and I'll also take uh, Malay's earlier question. What are the post-study work opportunities in UK and what support does the university provide in navigating those options? So that's the question which I'm posing to you. Now Malay's question is some other countries have been tightening admission and post-study programs for international students. How is UK moving on that front? Right. So UK has had uh, a recent change in the government. Now there is a new government after 14 years. There was a review going on in terms of whether we should continue with the graduate immigration route. That's the two years uh, that students get. Uh, but what was decided was that it actually favors the country and there will be no changes that are going to be happening. And there was a very positive response from um, the recent government as well that they will not be making any changes. So um, you can almost guarantee or see that now for the next uh, four to five years, till the next government uh, or the next elections happen, there will be no major changing changes that will happen. And UK is very much in support uh, of international students. We've recently seen that uh, Canada is now putting a limit in terms of the international students, but UK for now doesn't have that. Um, UK corrected a few things like um, dependent visas are now not allowed. Mm -hmm. And there was another change that happened that you cannot switch to a work visa while you are a student. So you need to finish your course and only then opt in. Um, so it was a new policy for UK and they've corrected a couple of things, but it's almost now on a very good path. And I don't think you should expect any changes, especially negative ones. I think it will uh, be quite positive right now from here. Moving to the opportunities that are there. Um, one course I highly recommend is uh, BSc Accountancy. So that is in collaboration with PwC. If you want to work with PwC, um, I think in 2019, 2018, most of them or like the entire cohort of the class got picked up and worked at PwC. Yes, so if you know accountancy is your thing, uh, BSc Accountancy Flying Start program, very, very good. Uh, it's in collaboration with uh, PwC and there's a person involved from PwC conducting interviews for this uh, particular course. So yeah. just like this, we have um, programs when it comes to drug discovery where we have really good tie-ups. Engineering, I've mentioned before. Uh, Rolls Royce is very good. Um, they have an, a big office inside and they're doing a lot of research. We are doing research with Aston Martin as well. So Russell Group University and we have really good tie-ups. So automatically they become an option where you have a industry tie-up. Uh, second option is that professors also have a lot of industry experience. Yeah. Uh, I remember that my professor was, let's say, the South Asia Coca-Cola head of marketing when I was studying marketing and they invite a lot of their friends to come in. So we had a lot of uh, 
like professors and their friends coming in uh, from different marketing agencies, um, from companies with like frozen food and all. So the exposure that you get is really good. Job fairs are there, but it's not an on-campus placement. So it's totally on the student um, that you need to build up the skills. What UK focuses on is skills. Mm -hmm. So what have you built in the three years, which is why I think a placement here really helps because then you get that one year of work X already in the UK. So getting a job becomes a lot easier. And um, they mainly look for an exact match in terms of the skills. So okay. what have you done in terms of the research? What have you part have you participated in any competitions? Uh, everything, if you're applying in for an artificial intelligence job or a coding job, what are the skills that you have? So your CV should reflect that in the three years. And we have a very good careers and employability service. So it is mm -hmm. a lifetime service for all the students. And uh, you can just go visit them, work on your CV, cover letter, uh, psychometric tests, any help that you need, they are going to help you out uh, with. So that's more or less the concept. Uh, where it differs is in terms of the on-the-spot campus placement. That's something that UK doesn't have. Uh, but by that time, in in those three years, I think you would have built up a really good profile and getting a job probably will not be that difficult. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you even for touching upon the career services as such. So now, uh, even like help us understand how strong is the alumni network of University of Nottingham and how students can uh, leverage that. So um, most of it is that we have um, now, let's say a lot of students are coming back to India. So we have separate groups for separate cities. We actually uh, next week in October have, I think, four professors coming in from the university okay. and um, we are organizing these meetups and sessions. So one of our alumni uh, in Bangalore, he's just started his own company called Goodcom and he got funding on Shark Tank. Okay. So now he's doing a session with us. Um, we have another professor who's at Azim Premji University. Um, I met a professor, I think about six months ago. She's uh, a professor at SRCC and okay. she studied yes. education leadership. So um, at all of these pre-departure events, we, we invite them. Uh, but how you're connected with them is through these WhatsApp groups mm -hmm. uh, where you can uh, take out help, reach out for help. Or if someone's hiring, um, the ones that are based in the UK has a different uh, group, so they they also keep on uh, posting. But now India, we we have we have in the last three years been paying a lot of attention um, in terms of the meetups and okay. getting them along the interactions. So a lot happening in terms of uh, there as well. Okay, so it's a strong alumni community uh, as such. Okay, yes, okay. Thank both, you so much. both if you come back in India and if you stay in the UK. Uh, I think the connections are very good and it's not just India now. I think they're organizing events in different countries. Um, so it's it pre pretty, pretty strong, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I have a few more questions as well, but I know we are drawing towards uh, the closure of the hour as such, but I will uh, still take Trapti's question and see like what inputs do you have uh, on that one. She's asking, what are the best universities for business management for undergraduate uh, program in UK? Okay, um, I will of course say Nottingham. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will say this from, of course, it's triple accredited, been there for a while. And I spoke about PWC and the careers and employability. But I would recommend uh, having a look at the campus. So we have a separate campus for business school and computer science. It's called the Jubilee campus and it's right across the lake. So we have two lakes in two different campuses and you have a library with no stairs. It's all spiral and you get the lake view. So very beautiful place to study and a good city. Um, you can look at other universities such as now it all depends on whether you're looking for a campus based one or a city based one. You can look at Manchester if you want. You can look at uh, Warwick where I studied. So Warwick has a good business school. Um, then you can move up to uh, Bristol being a very nice place to study as well. Birmingham. So all of them are really good. Now you need to go a little deeper and check who is teaching you. How are the professors? What are the facilities looking like? 
and are the accommodations good or uh, is the city life good what is the current research that the university is doing do they have funding opportunities or not uh, where are the scholarship opportunities so get into deeper research and start then shortlisting and crossing out uh, what you like and what you don't thank you so much for that rohil and definitely like researching well uh, for preparing your college list is the most important advice to students from our side and definitely just don't go by the rankings there are some important factors which rohil has already mentioned so that becomes if you do your research well i think you select your college list or you create your college list with a lot more conviction right so if you go into something with a lot more confidence then that helps as well so yeah i i totally agree with what you said in terms of factors to consider as well Plus, i would just like to add on that if you have time um make a linkedin profile i know right now you will not have it uh, because you're just 17 18 but linkedin really helps in connecting with people and if you can uh go and message four or five people who have studied at a particular university you will get a very good realistic feedback on uh, how the university is because those are the best people to answer the questions and give a realistic feedback in terms of the employability in terms of how their student experience was. So do put in that slight effort of uh, making a LinkedIn profile. Wonderful. Glad that you brought it up, Rohil. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think uh, if it is OK with you and uh, our students and like everyone is here already. OK, so if uh, we can continue for another five, 10 minutes, I think I'll be able to cover rest of my questions. And rest assured, uh, students, you will get few more insights from the questions which I have to ask. Uh, so just uh, be patient there as well. OK, so next question which I want to understand, like, is it possible to apply to UK universities like directly through UCAS uh, itself? Or do you recommend to take some assistance uh, from uh, authorized agents particularly? What's your take? and? what's rather the university's take on this and if both options are available what would you recommend uh, i think um so we do work with about 10 to 12 agents um i think uh, getting or uh, going through an agent really helps when it comes to the visa application because when you are putting in your application uh, for predicted grades it's going to come from your um professors yeah and um, your personal statement. But I think um, there is no harm in going to agents because first of all, they on a daily basis do a lot of applications. So they will have an idea on where you can go wrong. So because if you're doing everything on your own, it might be that little bit of, a, of an issue. I of course interact with a lot of students, but then beyond the point, I cannot contact a hundred um, so there, I think uh, we look for agent support where they do have all of the information about the university and it just helps in preventing any errors. So if you want, you can, of course, apply directly. Um, there is no UCAS is a very simple process because it's just uploading the documents and uh, selecting your universities. But if you think you want help when it comes to visa application and not get involved in like those complicated areas, then you go ahead with an agent. But it's totally up to your convenience yeah and just to add on to it like even uh, we being as an independent consulting firm right we are not any uh, universities agents we can also do any kind of hand holding you need particularly right. because uk universities process is straightforward but yeah you may need some hand holding and visa assistance as well so definitely uh, that's also an option available okay thank you so much for that rohil now let's move on to uh, another question which is from your standpoint, what are the common mistakes which you have seen uh, in the applications over the years, which students generally make and they might be overlooking a few things uh, here and there? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, the time of the application and mm -hmm. second, I think building up a profile um, around the coursework. So scholarship applications um especially when we focus on that um yeah. we look for things that the student has done around the academic area so build up your profile don't just um scores of course are very important but they miss out on a lot of other aspects like if you have 
interned with the company we really give value to that and um a misconception that working with an ngo etc will help in your application so i think that also is a big uh, misconception and most of them will get that uh, ngo experience but right now it doesn't really uh, help you or give you that edge so we are looking for very specific if you want if you are applying for a bsc computer science what have you done right now have you interned with the company uh have you tried to research uh taking a part in any competition uh being a president of the computer science club so we are looking at all of those things that relate to the uh subject area personal statement um you should really focus on apart from um your basic class 12 scores because that is the only factor that that will now uh, hamper your application so make sure that it's very simple it's very clear and you're not writing too many uh, stories so pretty simple process when it comes to the uk application because it's only three factors lor is not in your hands um so it is now only scoring well selecting the right course uh, by checking the modules and checking the uh, checking how the university is and third factor being the personal statement so very very simple overall thank you so much rohil so just to add on to one point which you mentioned uh -huh. in terms of building your profile yes so unlike say us as a destination which focuses more on your extra curricular profile uk focuses on something which we call as super curricular or co curricular which rohil already touched upon with few examples what have you done outside of your studies in terms of elevating your knowledge in your subject area of interest in which you are applying for so that categorizes more into super curricular and co curricular activities okay great so now uh, would be my last question to you rohil which is more around any advice for the students uh, who may be feeling overwhelmed or stressed during the entire college application process because this is what we see day in and day out through uh our hand holding we try to make the process as easy uh, or as convenient for them as possible but this is that time of their life where they are right. bound to feel little stressed out or overwhelmed so what do you have to offer in terms of advice there yeah i think it's a very natural process um i remember when i was applying um eventually it's a year long process because first you select the universities you shortlist to five um then you need to work on your personal statement then once all of this is done then the financial aspect which you need to show in your application for 28 days so all of this is a little stressful um mm -hmm. but um my this thing would be that you just stick to the simple processes you take help when needed and don't complicate things so you shortlist your five universities keep a couple of backup options in case of a situation where you score a little less than what um, you are expected to score and uh, visa rejections don't happen it's very few so i don't think there will be anything that will hamper your uh, application just stick to being into that simple process and things will work out great with a long investment though it is a one year investment you have to be ready for it and once you reach there also i think it's another 3 years that you're spending in and it takes a little bit of time to settle down as well but i think you have to be ready for it because the ultimate uh, value addition is a lot after the 3 years yeah rightly said i think it's a journey which they will have to take so just be relaxed a bit <laughs> exactly okay So with that I think we come close to our session today. So thank you so much Rohil for your time today and providing all the insightful responses. I'm pretty sure that this would have helped the students and parents in terms of making uh, in their decision as such uh, for college list creation or so. And thank you so much for all the participants as well. I know it was a Sunday afternoon but uh, I hope it was an hour well spent. So thank you everyone for attending the session today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye bye.